Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Nikki Krawczak, who is in Boston. How are you doing, Nikki? I'm great. How are you? Excellent. Doing really well. And uh, and uh, Nikki runs the Filthy Rich Writer. She's been a copywriter for 15 plus years, uh, working for agencies in-house, works as a freelancer. And she created Filthy Rich because there's never been a better time to be a copywriter. And that's what we're going to talk about today, how to become, how to get started as a copywriter. So let's uh, let's just start here. Is like, why is this a great time to be a copywriter? Um, yeah, great question. Uh, the thing is, is that there has never been a time before when companies have had more appreciation for good marketing and as part of that good messaging. You know, obviously in the past, companies have understood marketing and advertising, but they're more educated than ever and they appreciate the skills involved. Yeah. And I think, uh, and I think, and you, you could probably speak to this as well, uh, better than I could, but I think also there is, as you said, there's appreciation of good messaging, but there's also so much noise and there's so much content and stuff being written and pumped out and uh, that the, let's face it, the standards are, are very dramatically. So I think people appreciate when they come across well-written, well-thought-out content. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there is a difference between copy and content. Yeah. So mm -hmm. copy is, is marketing and advertising writing um, content, your, your blog posts, that kind of thing. That's content. That's uh, writing that's designed to educate, to entertain, or to inspire. Um, and to your point, there is a lot of content being pumped out. Um, the, uh, for better, or for worse, the barriers to entry there as a writer are a lot lower, which unfortunately also means that it's a churn and burn industry and it's hard mm -hmm. to make money at it. But co uh, copy, on the other hand, uh, is a is a skilled industry. And um, we are thus wonderfully uh, paid a lot more because of the skill and because of what we bring to the table when we're working mm -hmm. with a company or an organization. And then, then that's a, I'm glad you brought up the distinction because uh, I think there's a lot of people who today are using content writers to write copy and not knowing the difference between the two. And as you rightly point out, uh, you know, copywriting is is a skill um, and being able to convey ideas, and, and, you know, with brevity, being able to you know, really focus the messaging, all of that, that's really highly skilled stuff. So you see a lot of people, unfortunately, as you said, using content writers, and then you get things that aren't well thought out, that aren't very succinct, that aren't brief. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, a little tip is if your writer that you're going to hire doesn't know the difference between copy and content, <laughs> run the other way. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great point. Yeah. Um, so what are the what are the what are the skills needed? So if somebody's listening or watching this and saying, OK, I think I could be a copywriter. What are some of the skills required? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the, at a base level, if someone is interested in getting into copywriting, the the thing that all of our students have in common, and I think all copywriters have in common, is a genuine affinity for writing. And I know that that sounds kind of silly, like, well, why would you get into copywriting? But you never know, right? But but people who have a kind of a natural aptitude. Now, of course, there's a lot of training involved and you have to hone those skills. It is, it's a full career. So of course there is, there's work to do. Um, but when you start with that basic natural affinity and the funny thing about writers I've found is that we who, who do it relatively well naturally kind of assume that everybody else could do it. And that's not the case. The vast majority of the world really, really struggles with writing without, with, with getting getting a cohesive message across. And so someone who has that natural aptitude, first of all, needs to know that that is something really special. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I think, again, a great point, because I think that's, uh, there's a term for it, unconsciously competent. That's it, where, where you Absolutely. can do something, you can do something well or, or really well, but you can't for the life of you. You couldn't really explain to somebody how to do it. You couldn't even tell really how you do it yourself. It just happens. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a few people. But as you said, the rest of the the rest of the people need to learn uh, need to learn the skills. And and let's see when you start off. Like, uh, if somebody wants to get into into copywriting, right? Okay, and work with somebody like you. Mm -hmm. um, then what kind of what kind of roles can they expect? I mean, as a contractor or a full time? I mean, what what kind of openings does this uh, provide them? 
Yeah. Um, one of the great things about about copywriting is that it can be a very flexible career. You know, you, if you want to be full-time freelance, you can absolutely do that. If you want to be part-time freelance, if you want to be a contractor, if you want an in-house position, you want to work at an agency, great. You want to work at a creative team within a company. You can absolutely do that. Um, I personally, I have bounced through all of those at various points in my career as a, as a company is interested in me or a project has interested me. Um, I've always, always had freelance clients, whether I've been full-time freelance mm -hmm. or, or doing it on the side, in addition to a, a full-time copywriting career, but it's very nice. You can, you can craft a career the way you want it to be. And then when you want to change it, you change it. Yeah, no, I absolutely. I mean, I think it's great. And obviously in today's world, when you've got, you've got uh, Upwork and Fiverr, you've got all these different platforms where you can, you can go and, um, and, and hire people or whatever. But I mean, there's a lot more flexibility in terms of being able to provide your services globally than at any time before. And yeah, I know, again, it probably, probably works in the favor of really good copywriters. There's probably a lot of not very good ones on these platforms as well. But so you can probably stand out pretty quickly too. You can, but I also never recommend those platforms, quite mm -hmm. frankly. Um, what you end up doing is spending a lot of time writing proposals for, for a few projects. And unfortunately, because there are so many people on there and the people on these sites are looking to hire the best they can get for the cheapest they can get, you end up spending a lot of time writing proposals that don't get chosen. And if you do get chosen, you have to undercut your rates to compete with people who are from all over the world and kids like, can can offer crazy low rates or don't have the same living expenses or, or that kind of thing. It's a bad place to be. And on top of the fact that, that unfortunately, I've heard a lot of horror stories about clients um, um, holding, <laughs> holding projects hostage effectively and saying, okay, if you don't add this in for this price, we're going to give you a low rating. Um, it's just, it's a bad situation to be in. It's, it's, the, the ratio is bad. It's, it's one project to any number of copywriters and of varying degrees of skill, frankly. And the, the better scenario is to turn that around by uh, using the, the system that we teach our students to pitch clients. Very value-based pitches are, we have a lot of, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of clients, students that come back and say, I, my new client thanked me for sending this pitch to them. Mm -hmm. um, but in that scenario, you control your opportunities. You know, it's, it's not one opportunity and multiple copywriters it's one you and any number of opportunities and, and having a system for how to find clients and how to land clients and how to repitch clients means that you're in control of, of your opportunities and your income, your income and, and your workload. Yeah, so how do you, uh, so how do you teach people to, to do that? Because obviously there is the, if you were going to get into this or any kind of freelance or contract work, there is a temptation to go to those platforms we're talking about, because it seems like a a pretty short a shortcut to business which clearly it's not yeah right um, how many but, shortcuts to business actually work <laughs> yeah, right yeah exactly uh, so how do you how do you teach people to actually source um, work and employment yeah, well, I mean, it's obviously a bigger process, but in a nutshell, sure. um, in a nutshell, the, the we teach our students how to how to research clients, how to to find um, the kind of clients that might want to work with them, how to come up with ideas for clients because it's all very value based. We strip mm -hmm. out all of the sales from any pitch. Anything that's about sales in a pitch is about you, and a client doesn't care about you; they care about mm -hmm. what you can do for them. So the best pitches come in with genuine enthusiasm based on research search. You have to either no mass pitching, no cutting and pasting. Um, the, you present uh, an idea that will genuinely benefit their business. And then you say, you know, I, I'd love to talk to you about this. And then of course, too, because people's inboxes are crazy busy, you have to follow up each time also providing value, follow up a couple of times. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that we have students say, you know, I sent a pitch and I sent follow-ups a year ago and they got back to me today. People keep it in their inboxes and they, they mark it to get back to you, even if they're not ready at that moment. Yeah. And that's a, and that's a great takeaway uh, for people just to remember that uh, the unfortunate thing about buyers is that they buy on their time frame, not on yours. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, and this often does happen. We've heard of many cases like this of people coming back uh, a year or two later uh, because you were persistent, but also because you, as you said, you provided the, the value, you went about it in the right way. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of 
So if I'm if I have particular expertise in an industry or a technology or something like that, is it good for me as a copywriter to focus on a niche that I know really well, or is it better to be more broad in my approach? Yeah, you're going to hear a lot of people out there that will say, uh, "What the the riches are in the niches," um, mm -hmm. but here's the thing: just because something rhymes doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> um, when you are first starting out as a copywriter, you should not choose a niche. It's a bad idea and it artificially limits the the clients that you can take. Um, first of all, you don't know enough about writing for this industry to know whether or not you're going to like it. You know, what if you choose a niche and then six months in a year in, you go, God, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. Or same thing. You know, if you choose a type of writing, oh, I'm only going to write email funnels. Okay, great. But what if you burn out on writing email funnels? And the problem is, is when you choose a niche, you gear your website to that niche. So that, and all of your samples are for that niche. So if someone from a different industry or looking for a different uh, type of service comes to your site, happens to come to your site because they heard you're a great writer, they're going to look at your samples and they're going to look at your website and they're going to assume that you won't work with them. So they won't even get in touch with you. Um, instead, what a new copywriter should be doing is looking to demonstrate their depth and breadth of skill in their portfolio. And so the show that they can work for a bunch of different kinds of industries and write in a bunch of different kinds of voices. Then a couple of years in, once you have some experience and you know, if you want to, if you want to niche down then absolutely, but there's no need. And in fact, it, it's really dangerous to start out your career by limiting the kinds of clients or the kinds of work that you are, are willing to do. Um, and you may never need to choose a niche. I've never done it. I'm, I've been doing this for almost 20 years now. Um, and I love the variety of working with a bunch of different kinds of clients. Now it's, it's, <laughs> I will tell you quite honestly, it's terrible advice to choose a niche. Yeah, no, and it's great, great, great insight there. And I'm glad you, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. And also, I mean, to your point there, and I've seen this myself when, when hiring contractors is, uh, if you can't send me something that at least is close to or adjacent to the business I'm in as a sample of your work, uh, you know, then you're probably not likely to, to get it because otherwise I'm taking a chance. So in the example that you use there is if you have, if you have different types of customers from different verticals and all of that, then the chances are that you'll have something a little bit closer to when you're proposing to somebody, you at least have something to show them that's at least close to mm -hmm. their industry. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then uh, when you first get started, uh, so in terms of how you present yourself and what you charge and all that, because I think that's one of the other things that people often struggle with when they first go out on their own or they go out as a consultant or a contractor, you know, they, they're not sure what they should charge and they don't want to go too low because they don't want to be seen cheap, but they don't want to go too high because they, they don't have the background or the experience yet and they're not sure whether they can demand it. So how do you help people with, with actually um, figuring out what their worth is right now? Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, I wish I could tell you that there was a magic calculator. Mm -hmm. I think all of our students kind of, we say there's no magic calculator, but they always kind of think there must be a magic yeah. calculator. They're <laughs> holding back on us. Um, there is not, uh, but we do teach our system, our, our students uh, ways to figure out their, their project pricing, their hourly pricing, you know, based on their experience, based on, um, in a nutshell, based on their experience and then based on kind of an amalgamation of on staff salaries for their level. Um, do not use those salary calculators online. They're way, way off. So you have to do a little bit of research. Then you want to multiply that by like 1.2, 1.3, since freelancers make more than people on staff. And then once you've talked with your client, you've gotten a really, really good understanding for what the project is going to entail, like really in depth, then you want to figure out how long the, um, the initial call, the input call is going to take, how long it's going to take you to write the project, how long it's going to take you to, um, to edit the project. Cause there are always revisions. So there should always be revisions. Um, how long those initial, those next, uh, calls or check-ins with the clients are going to be multiply that all by your hourly rate. I'm going kind of quickly here cause I want to yeah, pack no, it no, in, no. but, um, um, but in a nutshell, uh, that's how you come up with the project project rate. You know, there is I you know I every freelancer struggles with with coming up with prices because and they sh quite frankly we we should I mean not struggle but it should be a new 
a, a new thought process every time because every project is different and every client is different. I don't trust uh, freelancers and I don't trust uh, copywriters who say, who don't even talk to me and say, well, this is the price you, <laughs> you know, and, and it's because every, every project and every customer, every client is different. And so a, a copywriter is going to need to, to factor that in. And I think the other thing that I just want to ask you about is, uh, and I'm sure you teach this as well, is so people with a penchant uh, for writing, uh, sometimes they can get a bit lost in their own world that they're not the greatest at, at you know, following up or answering questions or keeping people informed is because it's like, I'm deep in this. I don't really want to talk to anybody right now. But when you're working with clients, you have to have this good communication and a good cadence of communicating with them. Yeah, absolutely. You need to, we talk a lot about when you are working with a client, you're taking something off their plate. You know, mm -hmm. they had this project and they didn't know what to do about it. Or they, they, it was weighing on them and you are coming in, you're saying, yes, I will do this. You take it off their plate. But what that also means is that it has to stay on your plate. They, they can't have to worry about it at any moment. So you do need to, to check it. You know, if you, if it's a, if it's a month until your first draft is due, which happens sometimes, you know, you want to check in at least halfway through and say, hey, you know, just wanted to let you know things are going along great. We're still absolutely on track to hit your deadline, which of course you will always hit your deadline. Those are sacred. Um, but letting your client know, keeping them abreast of what's happening. Even, you know, even we, we teach our students when um, on their portfolio sites, you know, the, the form, get in, yeah. get in touch with me for a call. We say, look, on that form, you need to say something along the lines of when you fill in this form, I'll be in touch with you within 48 hours or something like that. It's just always so that the the client knows, knows what to expect. You always want to be anticipating their, their needs and their questions. And you want to be, it's all part of being the best, the best partner you can be. You know, you're not just, you're not just a vendor. You're not just a service provider. You are a partner. And part of that is anticipating their needs and making suggestions that sometimes don't even have to do with, with copywriting. If you think it's going to benefit the business, um, being a partner, I think is, is really what it comes down to. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And I think as, as part of that, uh, I think you have to be careful not to, you know, not to lose yourself in being a writer, uh, if you know what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, you know, you can't, you can't fall in love with your writing. You just can't mm -hmm. it, you, because part of it too, is that just as much of your writing is, is going to be editing. And we, you know, we teach our students that, and really every copywriter knows or should know that there needs to be a purpose for every single word you use. And that purpose can't be, oh, I really love this line. You know, yeah. that will happen sometimes in the messaging and it works in the messaging, absolutely. But if your main purpose is, oh, I really love this, it's gotta go, you know, save it for later. Maybe you'll actually be able to use it later. But um, but it's, it's, your writing is not about you. It's a collaboration between you and the client. You can't fall in love, you can't fall in love with your work. Uh, and yeah, you can't fall in love with being in your own head. And, you know, we talk a lot about, um, about scheduling things out. If you have trouble remembering to follow up the clients, yeah. put it on your calendar, put in a, and put an alert on your calendar so that it pops up and says, okay, email your clients today or whatever, make it easy for yourself. Um, but yeah, you can't get lost in your own head and you can't, you can't fall in <laughs> love with your work. You should be no, proud no. of it, but don't fall in love with it. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I think, uh, and that, and that discipline of self editing is so is so critical, uh, and and yeah, and and taking feedback as well, because obviously, yeah, you, people can get a little bit close to their work, but if you ever have, like you have, and I have done in my past, done done writing professionally. Um, you know, you've never lived until you've received back a manuscript that's uh, you can't see the black uh, print for the red. <laughs> <laughs> yes. for the red ink yeah yeah well you know hopefully the 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 especially with copywriting when yeah. the the input session that input call is really in depth and you really so that that you and you really you make your your client think about things they've never actually had to think about before mm -hmm. and you really get on the same page and you're clear on what the messaging needs to do and what are you who you're talking to what the benefit is you know all those various points that really helps reduce you should i would fully expect a round or two of yeah. of edits right because they're just stuff in your client's head that they don't they don't 
know to tell you and you don't know to ask them or whatever. But, um, but when you have a really great input call and a really thorough input call that really helps, um, eliminate those rounds and rounds and rounds and rounds and rounds. Cause I ide- not ideally you're going to do the work until your client yeah. is happy with it. Right. Mm-hmm. You can't all of a sudden be, uh, I'm always suspect of, of <laughs> copywriters or freelancers who are like, two revisions. Okay. But yeah. what if it's not good after two revisions, you know? <laughs> so, uh, you're going to keep doing it until your client is happy. But when you do a really great input call at the beginning, uh, chances are that it, it would say like the vast majority of the time, when you have a great input call, it is only going to take one revision, two revisions. Yeah. And then finally, uh, when you have a situation that's the opposite of that, where, uh, rather than one or two revisions, right? The revisions keep coming and keep coming. And maybe sometimes you definitely do reach a point where continuing to iterate is diminishing returns. And and so how do you manage that? Well, I mean, there are a couple of different scenarios there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if when you did the initial call and record all these calls and you, know, mm-hmm. you send things back and your clients are on the same page, if if the, the project has changed, if that's often what happens when you start to see these rounds and rounds and rounds of revisions, that's when you have to say, okay, wait, time out. Let's go back to what we originally agreed on Mm -hmm. because now we're talking about messaging that is different from the messaging that we agreed on originally. That's often what happens when you see those rounds and rounds and rounds. All of a sudden the client says, well, now wait a minute. Um, you know what? I thought we wanted to focus on this message, but it actually means we need to focus on this message. Um, then you need to go back and say, okay, time out here because the project has substantially changed. So I'm going to need to go back. This is what we agreed to. This is our, this is our written agreement. It's legally binding. I mean, wouldn't say those exact words, but you're thinking this, um, this is what we agreed to. And the project has substantially changed. So I can go back and quote for the new scope of this project, but this can't, all of these changes, it's essentially a new project. So it doesn't fall under our original agreement. That's, yeah. that's almost always when you see those crazy changes yeah and and then obviously that underlines what we we're talking about a few moments ago is that you have to project manage whether you it's not just going to be sitting there writing and staring into the ether i mean you have to project manage things you have to have proper project scope and as you just pointed out there you have to call out when project when the scope starts to creep or change Mm-hmm, absolutely. And, you know, be, be friendly about it, be civil about mm-hmm. it, but you can't just, if, if you let that happen, you're going to end up doing thousands and, th- you know, tens of thousands of dollars for a $2,000 project. Yeah. Um, yeah you know, there, there, it, it is tempting to, especially sometimes as a freelancer to want to stay in your little bubble. Um, you know, we sometimes say, well, can I just send out a questionnaire to my clients instead of getting on the phone with them? <laughs> um, no, you can't. First of all, cause it makes your client do more work. Yeah. You're going to take the project off their plate and now you're giving them work to do. Um, but second of all, you need that conversation because your clients are going to say things they are going to spark questions in you, or you're going to ask a question. And also too, when clients fill out questionnaires, they fill it out as fast as they can. Yeah. You know, they're not taking the time to think it all through because they want it off their plate. You need to take that time to get on the phone with your client and really have that conversation with them. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly, I think that's absolutely fantastic advice, because I do think it's just like, a, it's, it's a discovery call. I mean, you should be going down, you should be exploring, you shouldn't even be taking what they say at superficial levels, you should be driving down a little bit and really trying to get beneath what they're trying to achieve. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, those are valuable calls for the clients too. some of the things yeah. that you ask them, they may not have ever really considered before. And it's that is useful information and useful thinking for them. Yeah, it's one of the it's one of the four main value drivers actually is uh, coming up with a solution to an unanticipated problem. So mm-hmm. when you're working, as you said, when you're having that conversation, maybe you uncover something that they weren't aware of, and that's hugely valuable. Therefore, now you've just you've just increased your value to that organization. Exactly, and it could be that where you thought you're only getting one project from this client, now you're getting two. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Well, listen, Nikki, this has been fantastic. And all of Nikki's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and your business. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we are called Filthy Rich Writer, which boy, those people who comment on ads in the middle of the night really don't like. <laughs> but uh, to us, being filthy rich means having a job you love, 
doing it well and mm-hmm. getting paid well to do it. That's what it comes down to. Um, and you can find us, you know, on social media at Filthy Rich Writer. You can find us uh, at filthyrichwriter.com. And if you've been listening and you think, oh, you know, maybe there's maybe there's something in this copywriting to, to it, uh, something in this that interests me, um, go to freecopywritingtraining.com because we've got a, a free on-demand video for you to, to check out. Yeah, and I'd highly encourage you to check it out. And as Nikki said, if this is something you're considering, we've been through a very strange period with the pandemic. A lot of people are reassessing what they want to do, where they want to live, how they want to, you know. Uh, and so being able to do something like copywriting gives you a lot of flexibility, as you said. Uh, mm-hmm. Flexibility from wherever. In, from wherever, exactly. So I would encourage you to, to check it out. Check out the Copywriting uh, Training Academy and all the other great stuff that Nikki has to offer. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another interview really soon. And thanks again, Nikki, for sharing with us today. Thank you. Thank you.